Hey, Keto. <clears throat> hey, Teresha. <laughs> hey, you guys. Uh, <laughs> just Justin is fine. Kendra, hush. I was drinking tea last night. Okay? Mind your business. Huh? I don't even know what I was doing. Hey, Grams. <laughs> hey, Fiona. We give the people about another three minutes now to come on in. Hey, Nina girl. And then we will begin. <laughs> Listen, you got to worship. Oh, all right, Nina. Watch the replay. Hopefully, this will bless you. Have fun at the dinner. <laughs> hey, Pastor Camp. Hey, Taylor Rowe. Thank you for sharing, Teresha. Hey, Tasha Girl. <laughs> You caught it tonight. <clears throat> so this may, I'm going to give y'all a warning now, this may be a two-parter. Um, I mean he's on time tonight. This may be a two-parter. Simply, be listen, you got to know that he's the great shepherd. Let me tell y'all something. I listen to this song every night. Psalm is rain. I listen to this song every, hey Kendra, I'm sorry, because you came on being shady. I listen to the song every night. It puts me to sleep. Let me tell you something. Yeah, you're here. Um, yeah, I think I'm done. I'm trying to condense my notes so that I'm not looking at this big long page. Listen, Psalm is Rain. Y'all, if y'all don't have this, y'all gotta get it. It will literally bless you from beginning to end. I mean, from beginning to end. Kendra, don't start. All right. All right, they got about another two minutes, and after that, we're going to start. A man, a man. Listen, Teresa, let me tell you something. God blessed us last night like we was in church, right? Um, but he did. Last night was really good. It was really, really, really good. Um... Hey, Pastor, Pastor Smith, God bless you, woman of God. Listen, I mean that's Pastor Smith. Y'all better understand. Pastor Clap Clap, huh? Oh, okay. Put those hands together. <laughs> and clap, 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 clap. I love it. Hey. Oh, I'm sorry. Look at some. Listen, I mean our hearts burn. God, God talked good last night. Mouse traps catch bugs too. That's all I'm gonna say. Hey, Monique. All right, they got another minute. And after that, hey, my Liz. One more minute, and after that, we are gonna start. Amen. Amen. We honor the Lord. Yes, we do. By the time they come on. All right, it's 7.05. We're going to start. Um, we are going to start. Amen. So let me get this music turned off. I know sometimes my laptop moves a little slow. And if you would, hey, on Terry. If you would, if you could, please share this with your followings, your followers. We will um we'll do that. And then we'll begin. Amen. Oh, excuse me. But let me tell y'all something. God is good. Anybody have any uh calls made today? 
<laughs> Listen, there were a few calls that were made today. Guess who ignored them? Me. I didn't have time for it. And they weren't necessarily bad calls. They were just things that I just didn't need to give my energy to. Hey, Mom. Um, I didn't need to give my energy to them. So I, I consciously made decisions to ignore foolishness and not be trapped by just dumb stuff. Oh, I'll tell you, why are you upset? What's going on? I'm sorry, I said to cut this music off, didn't I? I did say that. Sure did. Amen. All right, um, so we're going to start off with a word. Listen, Monique, you got to ignore them. I mean, they started last night. My phone, all right, I'm not going to go there. Amen. Glory to God. <laughs> not time, wait till the altar call. <laughs> I can't do this. I can't. But um, all right, we'll we'll go. And my notes are condensed, so we'll go with that. Um, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We honor you. We give you praise and we give you glory for this time of fellowship. We thank you for those that are watching, those that will tune in. We're praying that something is said tonight that will stir somebody up, oh God, to call on you and look for you to answer and respond. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. <laughs> Y'all, my mom got a new phone. And um, she's learning how to work this. Uh, she's got an iPhone. She left Team Android, praise God. She got delivered. And um, she's on here. Hey, man, I had a paper towel here somewhere. Anyway. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about the call and response of the Spirit of God. Amen. The call and response of the Spirit of God. Um, so the scripture tonight is coming from Isaiah 65, 24. It's just one verse. Um, and it says... And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Um, so that right there, <laughs> I may work your new phone chaplet. Um, so that that basically, basically means that, you know, God, he, listen, that basically means that God hears us even sometimes before we open our mouths. He knows what we need. He knows what it is we desire. All we have to do is to ask him. Um, and I believe it's in the New Testament. I don't remember the book right offhand. But there was there were people that were praying. And while they were yet praying, their answer came knocking at the door. Like they were literally praying for, I think they were praying for John. And while they were praying for John, John was like, hey, I'm at the door. Like, what's up? You know, and that's how God does sometimes. So, um, so what we're going to start talking about is the fact that God does hear. He does hear us, um, and he responds to us, and then we'll talk about the ways that he responds and what he responds to. So like I said, this may be a two-parter. We're going to make sure that we try to honor our hour tonight. Um, and then after that, we will go ahead and do what it is that we need to do. Glory to God. Um, so he does hear, um, but the thing is, before a response can be given, there first has to be a call made, or there first has to be something heard. So, um, most of us are probably African-American. If you grew up in a black home, your parents, I'm sure, had this bad habit of calling you. And you say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. And, hey, Kachina. And before you, like, you decide to move, like, you wait to see what it is that they want. But they never say anything. And so, when I was younger, I think I probably got fussed at a couple of times. Because, you know, the typical thing is they call, you respond. They say something else, and then you act. That's typically the process. But my grandmother would have this thing and saying, Justin, and I would say yes, and she wouldn't say anything. And so that meant you need to come. <laughs> you heard me call you, and so you need to come. And that was the call that was made. And so I was responding to what I heard. And it took me a while to understand that and to get that, um, that system down. But now all of us, you know, now as I'm an adult, she still does it. If she calls me, if we're in the house together, if she calls me, I just know to come. And it was a little frustrating sometimes because the thing that she needed would be or could be something. Listen, they call you come. That's it. No questions asked. No, none of that. But it would be so that it could have been that the thing she needed could have been right in my face. But I had to walk past it to go to her and see what she wanted. She would tell me what she wanted. I had to go back and then bring it back. It was just really, really frustrating and really difficult, right? Because I'm like, you knew what you wanted. You knew that I was going to have to walk past the refrigerator. You know, I was going to have to walk past the TV. You know, I was going to have to walk past or buy whatever in order to get to you. But you still waited for me to come here to tell me to go back and get the thing that you knew you needed in the beginning. Keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to get there later. Um, so, again, before God can respond, 
we first have to give him something to respond to. You have to open your mouth. We talked about it last night. One of the most powerful things that God has given us is our mouth. It's, in, it's, it's our tongue. The Bible again says death and life are in the power of the tongue. So if you don't use the power that's in your tongue, sometimes you won't get anything. Or the things that you do get may not be what you would like to have. Amen? Amen. So again, he does hear, but before he hears, a response has to, before he gives a response, he first has to hear us. The scripture we read said, it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. So it's, uh, God is kind of ushering us into a season of quick manifestation. Before you even say, God, I need you to heal. God, I need you to work this out. God, I need you to do this, that, or the other. He's like, boom, I got it. Cause I knew you were going to ask me. And I know that the condition and the intent of your heart is right. Again, we talked about that last night. What is the motive behind why you do what you do? Um, and if he knows that our motives are pure, he honors what we say. Heaven backs up our words when, when our heart is pure before the Lord. Amen? Amen. Um, if this is making sense, if I'm moving too fast, please let me know, and then we'll try to slow down and go back and do whatever it is we need to do. Um, so I've got a few things here that God responds to. So it says, listen, what, listen, he responds quickly. It doesn't take him a long time. It doesn't take him all day. It doesn't take him all night. He's like, look, I'm God. I know what you need. And he's like, God, I need you to, I got it. Like, I'm going to send it. To you because I know that that's what you've been asking me for. Amen. And it says that. Um, so what are some things that God responds to? He responds to our faith. He responds to prayer. He responds to sin. He responds to sacrifice. And he responds to his word. Five things. These are not the only five. But these are the five things that kind of stood out to me when I was doing my study. Writing down my notes. So we're going to talk about these things. And if there's some more, we'll probably add them. Who knows? But again, God responds to faith, prayer, sin, sacrifice, and his word. All right? So we're going to go in that order. And so the first scripture that I talk about, um, that I jotted down, is Luke 1 and 38. All right? You guys don't necessarily have to turn to it. But it's, uh, it talks about when Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she received the, the salutation from the angel... She didn't question it. Well, she did. She said, how is this going to be? You know, the angel came and said, you know, Mary, you're blessed and highly favored among women, blah, blah, blah. All these other things like that's great. You're going to conceive of something. Mary was like, wait a minute. I don't I don't know a man like I haven't done the do. I haven't had that level of interaction with the man yet. So how am I going to get pregnant? Because the process is, you know, we do what we do. Then there's conception and all of that. And the angel said the power of the highest is going to come and overshadow you. And that's how it's going to happen. After that, Mary's immediate response was, be it unto me, as you say. She didn't understand it. Her circumstances didn't necessarily fit the criteria for a woman to give birth. They did not fit the criteria for her to bring forth a seed, to bring forth life. But because the angel said, God said he's going to do it. She said, you know what? At this point, it's out of my hands. He only wants me to be the vessel. Be it unto me, as you say. And God responded to her faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 11 and 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Faith is simply believing. It's believing that what God said is going to come to pass, whether you see it or not. I mean, in, in simplest terms, and I know it's a little difficult, but listen, if only we could say, like, how, how much better would our lives be if God said, I'm going to do this, that, and the other, and we say, be it unto me as you say. He never told her, hey, look, you and Joseph are going to have to run out of the city. You're going to have to give birth in a manger. You know, it's not going to be the most ideal of situations or circumstances, but I'm going to do this. And the thing that I'm going to birth through you is going to be greater than the little bit of pain and a little bit of sacrifice and a little ridicule and all this other little stuff that, that you're going to have to endure. The process to birthing is never as pleasurable as the, the thing that we give birth to. Amen. That was good. <laughs> the birthing process, it, it's not pleasurable. Like my cousin, she's pregnant now. She's miserable. Her hip hurts. You know, my back hurts and this and all this other stuff. But the one thing that she keeps saying is I can't wait until I get unpregnant because I want to see my son. I want to see the thing that's been growing, that I've been laboring, that I've been feeding, that I've been, you know, talking about, that I've been celebrating. I've been thinking about this thing so much. She's doing like another week or two. And so she's like, the only thing that I can think about now is it, even though I feel the pain and even though it's uncomfortable, even though it's hurting me and even though, you know, I feel like I, the things that I used to do, I can't necessarily do right now because I have to protect what it is that's on the inside of me. But because she knows that 
there's a seed in the, you know, God has told, you know, promised her and told her these things, you know, there's life. And if you do these things, then you'll have a healthy baby. You'll have a, a successful birth. She's done all of these things. So she knows that even this, this little temporary, you know, uncomfortability, uh, you know, I can't lay on this side. I can't lay on this. I got to sit this way. I can't do this. Like all of these things are going to pass. And when they pass, the thing that she's going to be able to hold in her hands, it's so, it's, it's worth so much more than her temporary discomfort. But listen, but a lot of the times we get so consumed with the level of discomfort that we can't appreciate the promise that's on the other side of the process. Myself included, I'm talking to myself. <laughs> he responds to our faith. God says, you know, uh, uh, one of the things he told me, he said, Justin, I've called you to be a prophet. Oh, OK. Like, I don't necessarily want to do that. Like, I had a list of things. God, I don't want to do this. How do I be like, I, I, I don't want to do that. But the thing is, if I had just said, be it unto me, as you say, who knows where I would or could have been by now if I had just said, you know what? You said it. You've got it to do. I'm just willing. Who knows? I don't even know. If I did, I probably would have done it. I probably wouldn't have ran for so long if I had known. But I didn't necessarily know. Oh, God bless you, cousin. She's probably going to do like pregnant people stuff or something. Hey, Jarrell. Uh, but that that's that's it. So he responds to our faith. Um, and so I was telling a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago, um, sure, point out something about faith. This is interactive. This is not just y'all listen to me. Let's talk. Let's have a conversation about it. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine about something. And I said, you know, it's <laughs> I said, it's funny how when God tells us these things, because he's the creator of the earth, he creator. I mean, you know, he created us. He created all things. And it's funny how when the creator of everything tells us he's going to do something, we question him as if he doesn't know what he's doing. Our faith needs to be strengthened. I know mine does. Um, and there's so many other, um, you know, accounts in the Bible of people who believe God for the impossible, who believe God, you know, with God, all things are possible. We have 66 books of things to look forward to. And somehow we all at some point, one point, find it difficult to believe him. And so my prayer even today has been, God, you know what? Help me to, to help my response. Let my response to your word be different. And I was telling a friend of mine, again, I, we were talking about, you know, you know, we've got all these prophecies, right? Like everybody's got a, a thousand prophetic words that they've heard over the course of the last couple of years. And, you know, it's like, you know, I, I keep hearing all this proclamation and this declaration, but where's the manifestation? Could it be that the reason that you have not received the manifestation is because your response wasn't the right one? Be it unto me, as you say, which means exactly what you said, exactly the way you said it, the way that you intended for it to come, be it unto me. So if you've given me the or if you promised me the anointing to heal, um, I'm sorry, I'm reading the comment. But if you said that you were, you were going to bless me or give me the, the anointing or the gift of healing, if I have to go through a period of being sick myself, I know that I can't stay sick because you've given me this gift. And maybe this is the process that... I'm sorry, you guys, give me one second. Boom. Thank you, to, uh, Marlis. I'm glad you said that. Um, but could it be that this is the process? This is my be it unto me moment that I have to go through and endure so that I can get to where it is that you promised me. Um, and I was watching a clip of this lady. She said that her son had this terminal illness, had this cancer, whatever, whatever. She said, and she told God, God, you can't like he can't die because I know what you've promised him. And if he does die between the day of his death and some point, you must be going to raise him. Completely broken English. You must be going to raise him because he can't die before he sees what you've promised him. Um, I'm uh, sure you guys can all read the comment. But you said God responded quicker and was more moved about um, the people's faith when they were crying out for a miracle for them or someone else. Your faith has healed you. And that's the thing. The things that we are going through, they all of the things come, they come to challenge our faith, to build our faith. Listen, you must be going to raise him. They come to challenge our faith. They come to build and to strengthen. I'm, again, talking about uh, the things I'm doing in my class. Next week, we're going to be talking about force and motion. And it's, um, listen, just like that. And it says uh, the Newton second law of motion essentially says the heavier an object is, the more force you have to put behind it to move it. 
the heavier the obstacle, the more force of prayer, of praise, of worship, of the of, of faith you have to put on that thing to until it moves. The Bible says that, you know, we've given us a mustard seed of faith to, you know, say mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. Like that's our faith doing the work. That's not us getting out there trying to lift and push a mountain, but our faith has power. It, it moves things. And we've got to understand that. So the first thing that is on my list that God responds to is our faith. Be it unto me as you say. Hey, Terry, be it unto me as you say. Not the way I think about it, not the way that I want it to work out, not the way that I think it should go because I've got this whole, I've got a good plan about how my life should go, but be it unto me as you say. And even if things don't work out the way that I think they should, I'm going to have enough faith in you and I'm going to trust you enough to know that you're not going to leave me in a place where I'm embarrassed for long, looking foolish, and that I'd never achieve what you promised me if I'm doing what you've asked me to do. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Excuse me. The second thing <clears throat> that God responds to is prayer. Um, second Chronicles 7 and 14, we all know. If my people which are called by my name, humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, you know, then what I hear from heaven. Now heal, you know, heal the sin and heal the land. Forgive the sin, sorry, heal the land, all of that. We know that God responds to our prayer. Jesus, listen. He never said because he never said if you Go on to Daniel fast, I'll hear you. When he healed the woman with the issue of blood, he never said, well, because you pressed against the crowd, because you went through this isolation period. He said, listen, I healed you because you believed enough in me that you came and you touched me. Listen, I mean, we've got to get to another level of faith because not to come for anybody's faith. I'm talking about myself. Sometimes this little low level of faith we got could be the reason that God ain't doing nothing. We might not even have enough faith to move an anthill and we're believing God for the impossible. It ain't going to happen. And he has to take us through these things and take us through these tests so that we could understand, hey, look, this is where I need you to be and I need you to get there. God wants to do something in us that <laughs> something in us that produces fruit that remains not fruit that spoils. Listen, and I was a friend of mine. Again, my Liz, my Liz is good. I love her. Um, I was talking to uh, my friend Vadine last week, or maybe it was the week before. Uh, we were talking about sacrifice, and we're going to get to that in a couple of minutes. But she was saying, I, I feel like I sacrifice enough. Like, I, you know, I have a couple of days, you know, that I set aside that I do these things. So should I do more? And I told her, I said, God is not looking about the amount. He's not looking at the quantity of how we do what we do. What he is looking at, though, is the sincerity of our heart and the purpose behind what we do when we do. Oh, love you, uh, Pastor Smith. You know, he's looking at that. He's not looking at, oh, well, she fasted seven days. Let me go ahead and do that. No. But if you can only fast two days a week, how are you doing? How are you handling that fast during those two days? And that's what God is looking for. And that's what he's responding to. Amen. Amen. The next thing, a uh, prayer. So, again, we're talking about prayer. Um, and another thing. When um when Lot prayed, you know, we look at the story of Genesis, um when Lot or the book of Genesis rather, um, when Lot prayed, he was like, God, look, I understand, like I know what you said about this city, right? I I get it, like we all a little jacked up down here in Sodom and Gomorrah, but if you could find fifty people, would you spare the city? God said, Listen, if you can find me fifty, I listen, y'all are good. He went from 40 to 30 to 20 to 10. He said, if I can find 10 righteous people in the city, I'll spare the city. Again, when Lot went to him, he prayed. He said, hey, God, look, like if you could find these few, like surely you're not going to be that harsh and you're not going to destroy the wicked and the righteous together. God said, I won't like I'm not that hard. But if you can like if you can't find them, y'all, I'm getting ready to roll that place flat. Like I'm going to flatten it out. And and again, like when Lot prayed. God heard him, you know, God, the Bible says, you know, when you call on me, I will answer you. You know, he answers with all of these things and we'll get to that later. But God is the God that answers. He, he literally answers us. You know, his, his ears are not short that they don't hear us. You know, his arms are not short that they can't bless us. He's not a deaf God. He's not mute. He's not incapable of doing anything, but we've got to open our mouths. You know, again, he's given us an opportunity. He's given us the tool to communicate with him. 
So why not use it? We use our phones to communicate to other people, whether it be text, call, Facebook Live like I'm doing now. And we find it so much easier to communicate with people who are fickle and who can only see our situations from their perspective. But if we took that time to pray, then we would probably see our situations the way God sees them. And if we get his perspective on what we're going through, our response may be different. Again, God responds to faith. That was the first thing we talked about. He responds to prayer. So what are you saying when you pray? Are you telling him about everything? Like I get it. Tell him all about what's going on. But then at, at the end of that, are you declaring a change in your situations? Are you declaring something different than what you see? It's good that you can tell God your reality, but are you combating your reality with the truth of what God says about it? I'm sorry. That That's... Again, same thing for me, like, God, I know there's a lot of things going on, but your word says, and the truth of the matter is you cannot lie. You said, in the, you know, that you honor your word above your name, kind of jumping all over the place. But if you honor your word above your name, and if your name is the highest name that we have, that the righteous can call on that name and be saved and be healed and be delivered and be all of these things. And if you honor your word above that, I mean, there's no reason that I should worry concerning what you said about me because you've got to bring it to pass. All right. Um, God responds to sin. Um, Jonah, the first, you know, the, the book of Jonah, we know that uh, Nineveh was a terrible place. You know, again, even Sodom and Gomorrah, it's not so much about what was going on. It's the fact that they were sinning. We're not talking, uh, you know, all of the other stuff. We're not going to get deep. Sin is sin. No matter what they were doing, if they were lying, it was sin. I mean, it just so happened that they, you know, were participating in some other things. You know, Nineveh, again, was a very, very wicked place. God sent, you know, again, he sent warning before he destroyed it. So he wasn't just, um, you know, harsh and like, you know what, they ain't got it together. Boom, like, let's just kill him. Let's take him off the face of the earth. No, he said, they're sinning. I'm going to send them a word of warning. I'm going to let them know, listen, don't go. Listen, we've got to go there. God responds to sin. He did it in Genesis. He did it in Revelation. He did it all the way in between. He responds to it. And typically his response is not the one. It's, it's not a favorable thing, but he always sends a warning before he gets up and starts flexing. With Sodom and Gomorrah, he sent them angels. He said, listen, go check it out. Let me like bring me back a report. And like they couldn't even get there because the lust of the people was so high that they almost overtook the angels. After that, God responded. Nineveh, God sent a prophet. He sent Jonah. Jonah decided to run. And again, because of his disobedience, again, that was sin. God responded and he ended up in the belly of a fish. You know, there are countless times uh, Ananias and Sapphira, when they decided to lie to the Holy Ghost, God responded. The response to, to, to their sin was death. The wages of sin is death. God is a responding God. There's a responding and, and it comes from, and it comes from God. And when God responds, like I said last night, every response that God gives is not always favorable, but it will be, it's warranted. I will say that it's, it's not always favorable, but it's warranted. If God tells you, Hey, don't do that. And if you do, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. When he does X, Y, and Z, you can't be upset. You can't be mad at him because he said, look, this is what I'm going to do. I, I listen, I'm going to do it. He responds to sin. Um, then he responds to sacrifice. One of my, I got a lot of them, but one of my favorite stories in the Bible um, is the story of Rispa. She's found in 2 Samuel 21. Talks about, uh, she was the wife of Saul. Uh, you can read it. We're not going to go all the way, all the way until we've got 30 more minutes. Um, well, 35 more minutes because we started five minutes late. But it talks about Rispa and her sons were murdered. They were hung, all, hanged by a tree, from a tree, and they died. After they died, they were left out in the open. And so Rispa said, you know what? Not my babies. Like, you're, you're not going to leave my babies in the street so that the beast of the air or the birds of the air and the beast of the field can come and eat them up and pick on them and, you know, just tear them up. So Rispa put herself in sackcloth and ashes and she laid on a rock. And for an entire season, she laid there on top of them and she protected them even though they were dead. Get this. Even though they were dead. Rispa wouldn't let the vultures come and bite them or, or eat them. She wouldn't let the buzzards come. She wouldn't let the beasts that come and, and feast on rotting carcasses. She would not let them come to eat up her seed. She said, listen, let me tell you something. 
If you come over here like that, you are going to limp back. And I can imagine that she looked super, super crazy out there like, all right, Rispa, your kids are dead. They're decomposing. They're rotting. They're stinking. They're funky. But Rispa said, no, these are King's kids and they are not going out like that. They're not going to like, you're not going to do my babies like that. And it, it, it talks again about a mother's love. But even in their dead state, Rispa laid there and she waved the birds away. She kicked the beast. She fought. And listen, let me tell you something. You've got to be a strong and a determined person to fight off a beast and a buzzer. Y'all know I'm scared of birds. But let me tell you something. I probably wouldn't have fought off the buzzers. I'd have been like, you know what, buzzers and vultures, y'all can go ahead and have them. Like, I'm sorry, kids. I love y'all. Like, y'all are dead anyway. But Rispa said no. And because of her sacrifice, like somebody, you know, towards the end of the chapter, somebody went and told David because David was the one who ordered the decree to have the sons killed. Go back and read it. It'll bless your life. But her, her sacrifice got the attention of the king. And David said, even though they've been dead all this time, bring me a pen. Let me sign the decree and give Rispa's sons a proper burial. Now, David could have been like, you know what? Just let him stay out there. You know, he was the king. He had the power to do these things. He said, listen, give her sons a proper burial. Bury them correctly because at the end of the day, these are still children of the king. The king, uh, in essence, in this situation, not that David is God, but, you know, rep a representative of God, her sacrifice got, uh, got the attention of the king and the king responded accordingly. You stand with you. Are, are we, we stand with us? Stand with me. Her sacrifice moved the king so much that he signed a decree to say the thing that's going on has to stop immediately and something else has to happen. You're fasting. Um, and it's not again, it's uh, not about the length or the time period necessarily of the fasting, but how desperate and how determined are you to get what it is that you need from God? The, the parable of, the, uh, uh, of the, the unjust judge, when the widow came to him and said, listen, I need vengeance from my adversary. You know, the Bible says he didn't regard God. He didn't fear God or man. He said, okay, that's great. But she went to him every day. She was persistent. She sacrificed because I'm sure that there were things that she could have done that she wanted to do. But she sacrificed and she said, you know what? If you don't do it today, I'm going to come back tomorrow. And if you don't do it that day, I'm going to come back tomorrow. And if you don't do it that day, I'm going to come back tomorrow until he said, listen, whatever it is that she needs, give it to her so that she can leave me alone. When you make the decision and you make the effort and you make the, the conscious decision and, and the choice to sacrifice something for God, he has to respond. Anytime somebody in, in the Bible sacrificed, there was a response and the response was typically overflow. It was something different than what they saw uh, uh, when the widow gave the cake to the prophet. She said, listen, this is all I got. Me and my son, we're going to eat this and we're going to die. He said, listen, give me a cake. Bake me one first and let me eat it. And then after that, God's going to do something in your life. She was like, look, I don't know how this is going to work. But because I trust you to be a man of God, I'm going to go ahead and do this. And it says that her house never stopped flowing with oil. She, <laughs> listen. I made this man one little biscuit. Like I made him a Cheddar Bay biscuit. My grandmother preached this thing a couple of, uh, I think earlier this year, let me tell you something that blessed my life. I'm going to make him a Cheddar Bay biscuit. And because of my one act of sacrifice, I'm going to have an abundance of stuff that I, listen, I won't be in this situation again because I sacrificed and the intent of my heart wasn't, well, I mean, if he don't give me nothing back, then we're going to fight. No, she was like, look, God, be it unto me as you say. You're a man of God. You're a prophet. And they respected the office of the prophet so much back in that day. It's kind of watered down now. But we're not going to get there. That may be next week. But they respected the people of God and the men of God so much that she said, you know what? Because you said do this, I'm going to put the word of the Lord to the test. And when, I mean, she was blessed because of it. Like, hello? You got oil for days. Like you, like you real oily. You got the oil. Because of a sacrifice, because of a Cheddar Bay Biscuit. Let me tell you something. Is there a prophet who want a, a, a Cheddar Bay Biscuit? Listen, I will gladly go get you one if that's going to be the answer to, to my deficit. You see what I'm saying? Like he responds to our sacrifice. Again, Rizba, I love it because not only was that uh, an unfavorable situation. Hey, Mama Elise, that was an unfavorable situation for her sons and for the seven descendants of Saul. 
But that was also unfavorable for her because she couldn't take a day off. She couldn't take a moment off and have somebody else stand watch for her while she go, you know, while she went to take a shower or while she went to eat, while she went to do all of these things, while she went to enjoy her life. No, she was there laid upon the rock, stretched out over those kids. And she said, listen, until something changes, I'm going to be right here. I'm not moving. So something's got to change before I move. And it wasn't so much, again, about the length of time. It was about her determination and her posture. Look, God, I'm going to be right here until you do something. If you ain't do it in this month, listen, you got another month to do it. You didn't do it in that month. You got another month to do it. And again, her sacrifice got the attention of the king. And he immediately signed the decree to say, listen, Give them kids a proper, a proper burial. It was the posture. Listen, let me tell you something. If something's dead, I'm not going to lay over it. It's gone. But even in the midst of that, she said, you know what? I know what this dead thing once represented. This dead thing once represented royalty. It represented power. It rep hey, Nicole, it represented wealth. And because it represented all of those, all of those things, I'm not going to let it just go out and die and just be wasted away with the rest of the world. The thing that I'm laying over, like I gave birth to this. And even though it's dead, God, you still gave me this thing. You promised me life. You gave me all of these things. And even though it's dead and it's laying dormant right now, I'm believing that if I sacrifice and if the intent of my heart behind the sacrifice is pure and if it's uh, uh, good and if it's pure hearted and all of that, that you're going to do something that will change everything that I see. I'm sorry, I felt the Lord creep up on my left shoulder. That thing got good to me. He, he responds to our sacrifice. What are you sacrificing? And if there's no sacrifice, there may not be a response of overflow. Tithing is a sacrifice. Not only is it, is it a commandment, but it's a sacrifice. Again, when you, listen, when you look at the, the amount, granted it's only 10%, but when you look at what bills and what things you can do with that 10%, you'd be like, look, the wheels of that mind get to turn it. You're like, you know what? This is a sacrifice. But again, Malachi 3 and 10, if you give me this 10%, not only will I let you keep the 90, but I'll multiply that so that it'll look like sometimes the 10% was never missing in the first place. Again, he responds to our sacrifice. I, <laughs> listen, this is getting good to me. Dang, we run out of time. We got 20 more minutes, and I'm only on part number three. And I haven't even gotten to how he responds. But again, like our sacrifice is what he responds to. Not about all of these, you know, tricks and, you know, we're, we're in. No, how, what are you sacrificing behind closed doors so that when you get on the platforms, that he responds to what you say? Are you spending that time with him when you could be watching TV, like when I could be sleeping right now? Because I'm a little tired. But are you, listen, uh, I love Marlis. Uh, listen, it's been an increase going from church service. To, listen, nobody training, nobody speaking life. Help me back. Oh, praise God. <laughs> listen, uh, just a little tidbit. I met Marlis at a service. I think it was like a year ago, two years, two years ago, I believe. Um, and since then, she's just been such a dear sister. I love her. She sends me messages to encourage me all the time. And it's good. Um, but sometimes that's all we need. We just need a word to shift us into another place. And then after that, we're like, you know what? God, I got you. I got you. Again, let me tell you something. There have been some times, there have been some things that I've prayed over, that I've sacrificed. And again, and, and here's the good thing about it. Risp of sacrifice didn't necessarily get her kids to come back to life because we know that he's a resurrecting God. Her kids didn't come back to life, but the position that they were in while they were laid out dead changed. So all the time, our sacrifice is not going to necessarily warrant a complete change in our, our situation, but something about it changes. And again, that sacrifice is still worth it because no, no parent, I'm assuming no parent wants to see their children lay out in the street and let the birds and, and the buzzards and the vultures and all these things, you know, maggots and mice and rats just come and eat up their child. Spiritually speaking, the things that God, nobody wants to see your promise be eaten away by something who never understood the value of the promise in the first place. All right. I'm going to calm down. Listen, a person who doesn't understand the value of your promise will never be able to appreciate it in the fullness of it. They won't be able to appreciate it the way it needs to be appreciated because they didn't suffer for that thing. Again, my cousin, she's just coming in the house. She's pregnant. And so it would be one thing like nobody, no mother, I'm giving you a compliment. 
no mother will take care or nobody else will take care of a child the way that their parent will take care of it. Nobody will take care of what God has given you the way you would take care of it. And one thing I said to a person that was ministering to them, I said, the Lord said that you've got to use what he's given to you because if you don't, he's going to take it. And when he takes it, he says he's going to take it in front of you and give it to somebody that won't cherish it the way that you do and doesn't have the understanding of the gift the way that you do, but they're willing and he'll do it in front of your face. I said, God, you sure you want me to say that to her? Like, that's not... That's not the buttery hotness. Like, that's not a favorable word, but I had to give it. And after that, she said, you know what? God has been telling me that I need to use the gift that he's given me. And if I don't, he told me he would take it from me. And it's a hurting thing for you to have something and know the weight of it, know the power of it, know the, the depth of it. And then somebody come and take it. I'm glad, Ma, Ma, that's good. Somebody come and take it and be careless with it. If you've worked all your life and you've saved this money and then you, you've worked for it, like you cherished it and you give it to somebody and they go and just blow it all as if it doesn't mean anything, you're going to be right mad. I guarantee you, you're going to be mad. And that's how it is when we don't use the gifts that God has given us. He snatches them from, you know, the parable of the, the 10 talents. He said, listen, I've given you this. Take it and do something with it. Reproduce after the gift that I've given you. And when he came to check on it, he said, well, what have you done? I multiplied it. I got this amount. Cool. God bless you. Multiply this one. Got this one. Boom. Enter into the joy of the Lord. What you do with it? Well, you only gave me like a little bit. And so like I didn't do nothing with it. Like I sat on it. I buried it. I put it away because I wanted to protect what you gave me. Right. But in you protecting what I gave you, you didn't reproduce and you didn't make a deposit anywhere else. So go ahead and give me that back. No, come on, run me my gift back and let me give it to somebody else who's going to do it. And then the person that he gives it to may be a person that already has something that they're working. So now they've got a double portion of something. And you sitting there looking like, so uh, I ain't got no gift. Just snatched. Your gifts are snatched. Why? Because you didn't do anything with it. And again, you sacrificed too much already for the things that God has given you. Hey, <laughs> you've sacrificed too much already. So it would be no, like, it's it's crazy to me that after you've already sacrificed, you just let somebody else come and take it. I work every two weeks and I get a check every two weeks. It would be pointless and stupid and almost crazy of me to let that whole check come. And then the day that the check hits my account, I go and give my whole debit card to somebody else and let them do whatever they want to do with it. And then I'm, I'm stuck looking crazy. Again, God responds to our sacrifice. And after the time of our sacrifice, he brings about a change. Hallelujah. That was good. <laughs> the last thing, um, we kind of talked about this a few minutes ago. One of the last things we're going to talk about is that he responds to his word. Hey, Deontay, he responds to his word. The word of God, Psalms 138 too. he honors his word above his name. Again, we just talked about this. If his name is a strong tower and it's a fortress that we can run into and find safety and it's by his name that we're saved and it's at the sound of his name that demons tremble and that they flee and that, you know, all of this power is in his name, if he honors his word above that great name, like, what kind of stuff is that? Like, when God says, I put my name on this, you know, I, the Lord your God, am going to do this. You know, the Lord says this, and he says that, I'm going to bless you. I've given you the gift of healing. I've, you know, I'm going to cause you to prosper, and your name's going to be great, and all of these things, whatever he says concerning you, when he says that, like, <laughs> he's waiting to manifest that based on the way that we respond. Again, uh, when, when he told Adam, uh, Abraham and Sarah, I'm going to give y'all a baby, she laughed. She said, uh, <laughs> that ain't, that ain't going to happen. I'm old. Like the time has passed, you know, like I'm past childbearing age. And he's like, okay, but what I say, guess who's going to have a baby? You. And at the appointed time, guess who had a baby? Her. Because God said it, because he responds to his word. Not only, not only does he respond to the word that he speaks, he responds to his word when we give it back to him. So if I find myself, listen, he honor, Kendra, like I almost got real hood, like dog, like, listen, he honors his word above his name, right? So my grandmother, you know, when we were young, she ran the house. If she said something, you did it. Why? And if uh, and if a person didn't do it, um, you, well, grandma said do it. 
or mommy said. Do we all have that? You know, you tell your siblings, wash the dishes. I ain't doing nothing. Mom said, wash the dishes. Oh, then they get up and do it. <laughs> do that. You know, uh, my, my best friend, you know, she was like, I, so, something about coming to church. Um, she didn't do it. But my grandmother called and said, you know, Nina, I want to see you at church. Guess what? She got up and she got to church. Hey, Pastor Pittman, because she honored the person that did it. She said, you know, Grams asked me to come. So I'm here. We all have those people. You know, we have our coworkers, our friends. You know, if you go, I'll go. If we have, you know, well, such and such said they was coming. All right, if they're coming, I'm coming. God says, if I said I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it just because I'm God. And then if I find myself in a place where I'm sick and I'm afflicted and I say, but God, your word says that by your stripes, I am healed. Your word says that healing is the children's bread and I need some bread. Again, I need a Cheddar Bay biscuit. Guess what? He's obligated to perform his word because I gave it back to him. And his word again says that his word will not go out and come back to him void, which means that whatever that word is sent to do, it's going to do it. It's going to do it. It's going to happen. You know, God said, look, I'm going to heal you. And sometimes we don't even know, like, I ain't sick, but okay, God's going to heal me. But then we find ourselves in a situation where we're like, you know what? I am sick. And, you know, God, you did say that you were going to heal me. So even though I have to wait this sickness out, I'm believing that at the end of this process, I am going to be healed. And when you heal me, you heal me and you put me in a place greater than where I was before I got sick in the first place. Listen, I mean, we're going to have to go to Red Lobster this week. <laughs> Listen, but it, it's, it's just it's just like that. Like God does it. Hey, Monique, just like that. What I said I'm going to do, I'm going to do. And then when you find yourself in a position where you don't understand, give me back, put me in remembrance of my word. That's what he said. And when you put me in remembrance of it, I'm going to act because I said it. And the day that I let my word fall to the ground, I stopped being God. Listen, the day that one word that God has spoken to you in your life falls to the ground. He stops being God. Uh, testimony time. A couple of years ago, um, I was kind of dealing with some stuff and it was really, really hurt and broken. You know, some other things that happened. And I told God, you know, we were in the service and the Lord kept telling me, Justin, I need you to trust me. I need you to trust me. And he kept saying, trust me as father. I don't know my biological father. I had some father figures that just kind of did some stuff that hurt me and messed me up or whatever. And he said, listen, I need you to trust me as father. Get this. I said, God, listen, you know that my frame of reference for what a father is ain't the greatest. And because I know you to be good, I can't put that and attach that to your name because what I know a father to be, you're not like that. Your word doesn't, your word doesn't say that about you. Your word doesn't say that you're disloyal, that you're flaky, that you're shifty, that you're faulty. Your word says that there's no failure in you, but because I found failure in fathers, I can't trust you as father because I don't want to put that on you. We sat there, we had this conversation for about 10 minutes. And I said, God, I don't, I don't think I can. The Lord said this, I lied to you now. The Lord said to me, if you can muster, he said, I know that they've hurt you. But if you can muster up enough strength to trust me one more time, I'll prove to you that I'll be the father that never fails. And the day that I fail you, you have my permission to go and do whatever you want without penalty. He said, I'm putting my name on the line with this one here. He said, the day I fail you, you have my permission. God, thank you. You have my permission to go and do whatever you want to do without penalty. And you have the right to tell everybody that I am not God. And so I'm sitting there and I'm crying and I'm weeping. We got 10 minutes and after that, we're going to go. 15. I'm sitting there and I'm crying and I'm weeping. I'm like, God, listen. Like, I, I know what you just said, and that's all great, and that's fine and dandy, but listen, I don't want to do you like that because I've seen you heal some people, and I've seen you do some things. I've seen you work some ways for my family and, you know, for me, but if you're willing to give me, listen, I mean that was deep. If you're willing to give me 
a free pass to go and enjoy life with no penalty, if you're willing to put your name on the line in that way, I'll do it. Since that day, he has not failed on anything that he's spoken to me. I Listen, let me tell you something. And, and the, the thing about it is the reason that I took him at his word is because I was looking for him to fail. Because there were some things that I wanted to do. I had a bucket list of some things that I wanted to do that I could not do because of my commitment to him. But I said, if you're willing to put your name on the line in such a way that I can say that you are not the Christ, that you are not the anointed one, that you are not the resurrected son of God, I will do it and I will trust you. And to this day, he has not failed me yet. It may not have always been good. Things may not have always worked out the way that I thought they should or would, but he has never failed me. Never has he done it. And I've told this testimony to a few people. This is the first time I think I'm telling it uh, to, 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 I guess, anybody who wants to watch it. But let me tell you something. God will be the father that never fails. And the day he fails will be the day that you can say he's not God. And I guarantee you, you'll be waiting on that day. Until he comes, even because every even when your natural father has failed, he still won't fail because he's got a reputation and he sets his standards here and man can't come that high. The most that they can probably do is here. And I can get to even if you've had a good father, they won't compare to the way that our heavenly father does. I guarantee you that. All right. (laughs) Lord, I told you this might be a two-parter. We got eight more minutes. So those are the things that he responds to. Quick recap. He responds to faith. Be it unto me as you say should be the response of our faith. Be it unto me as you say. God, whatever you say, be it unto me. Whatever process I have to endure, be it unto me. Whatever thing I have to, to, whatever hardship I have to face, whatever struggle I have to encounter, Be it unto me, as you say, because I know, as my friend said yesterday, the end result is heaven. And it's all going to be worth it because I get to see you in your majesty and in your splendor at the end of it all. And then I can sit down and I can ask you why. I can tell you all about my problems. But listen, at the end of the day, I'll be able to sing a song that the angels can't sing, which is that I've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. All right. He responds to faith. (laughs) He responds to prayer. He responds to sin. He responds to our sacrifice and he responds to his word. If you're looking for God to respond, give him back his word. (laughs) Thank you, Monique. If you are looking for the Lord to respond to you, give him back his word. I'm not trying to listen. I'm getting ready to shout myself. Let me tell you something. This thing just blessed me again. Like I had to remember the place that I was in when I had that experience. He said, the day that I fail you, you have my permission to sin. Listen, the angels can't sing the song that says I've been delivered. The angels can't sing the song that says I've overcome. Huh? They can't sing that, but I can. And that'll be my portion when I get there. All right. So that's what he responds to. <laughs> How does he respond? These are Deontay, where are you going? Come back. <laughs> How does he respond? Again, these are not necessarily going to correlate with the things we just talked about, but then again, they might. He responds with rescue. Give him back his word. Listen, we got six minutes, y'all. Six minutes. <laughs> We're gonna have to come back tomorrow to do part two. Uh, how does he respond? He responds with rescue. Exodus 3, uh, verses 7 and 8 says that uh, when the children of Israel cried out to God, he said, listen, tell Moses, go tell them people, I've heard their cry. I've seen their, affl- listen, they can't sing the song that he's their redeemer. All right, M- Nicole, pull me out of that. He says that I've seen their affliction, like I've heard their tears, like I've done all of that, like I get it. And I'm sending you, like I've come down to, the, to deliver them. I'm sending them a deliverer Because I've heard what they, like I've seen their affliction. I've seen what they're going through. I understand. And now I'm moved to snatch them out of it. He responds with rescue. 
again, well, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard. The standard that, we're, that they're talking about is, listen, my redeemer. The standard that they're talking about is essentially a wall. So when the enemy comes in, he raises up that wall so that the enemy can no longer penetrate and get to us. He protects us. He is our rescuer. Huh? He rescues us from the hand of the enemy. Listen, Kendra, she's trying to get me stirred up. I got four minutes. I'm trying to... <laughs> Exodus 3, 7 and 8, he, he responds with rescue or he responds to us by rescuing us out of the plight that we're in, even if they're self-inflicted. Sometimes it's not necessarily the fact that the enemy has ensnared us. Sometimes we walk into these traps, but even in that he's just enough and he's God enough to say, I'll rescue you. After you've suffered a little while for the things that you put yourself in, or after you've suffered a little while until you respond correctly, be it unto me. After you've suffered a little while and you say, you know, God, look, I understand that you're working something out in me. Or you're working something in me that I need so that I can produce something greater than where I am. Listen, some of it's self-inflicted and some of it is just your natural testing. God, I know that you're trying to produce in me fruit that will remain, not rot. Fruit that I can that I can make a good apple pie with and not give somebody something that spoiled. Hey, Erica, fruit in me that will remain because I understand what you're doing and what you're trying to do in me, through me and for me. I understand that you're going to rescue me at the appointed time. The only thing I have to do is wait until that time comes. Job, I will wait until my change comes, even though I don't understand why I'm suffering I don't understand why I've lost everything and everyone that I've ever held dear to me. I don't understand any of that. But what I do understand is that you're too wise to make a mistake and that the things that I see, you do not see because you see further ahead of me. And because of that, listen, fruit that remains. And because of that, I'm going to let you work this thing out in me, through me, for me and with me because you're not going to leave me in the situation by myself. You're here with me. Listen, good bananas for banana pudding. Huh? Listen, I I have no choice but to wait because if I try to run ahead of you, hey, Mikhail, if I try to run ahead of you, I'm going to make a mistake of this thing. <laughs> Listen, when I was younger, dang, we got two more minutes. When I was younger, uh, my, my first meal, I fried chicken, right? I had the fire up too high. Like I watched my family do it, watched my aunt do it, watched my grandmother do it. I had the uh, fire up too high. So the outside was like, I mean, when I tell you the outside of that chicken was the bomb, like it was beautiful. It was golden brown. It was crispy. It was good. But when we started to bite into it, we said, wait a minute, bloody murder. Huh? Because I ran ahead. Like I didn't ask the right questions. I didn't do all the steps that I needed to do. I had the fire up too high. And because the fire was up too high, it produced something on the outside that looked greater than what was on the inside. Oh, okay. <laughs> Listen, because I tried to make the process go quicker, because I thought that I could do it all by myself, it produced something great on the outside that wasn't ready to be presented to anyone else because of what was on the inside. And because of what was on the inside, if they had continued to ingest it, it would have made them sick. And they could have died. Because I wanted to rush the process. No, good things take time. So I needed to turn the fire down, let that situ let that chicken fry a little more, you know, maybe poke a couple of holes in it to make sure it was done through and through so that when I presented it to somebody, it was something that they could receive and partake and then give over to somebody else. Listen, my nephew cooked. It was the bomb. Maybe you should come over to dinner. Because it's not just for those that are around you. When God blesses you and he gives you something, he gives it to you for other people. <laughs> but you trying to let the fire, but the fire's up too high. And so because, oh, I made this chicken, you know, snapping pictures, taking all of this, you know, put it on Facebook, all on the gram, all on Snapchat. But what people don't know is that what they see ain't really all that they're getting. Like what they see is not all that they see. They see the outside. But what does the inside of that thing look like? I don't know how we got there. Goodness, it's 8 o'clock. Listen, Erica, listen. All right, I got five more minutes because we started at 7.05. He responds with rescue. Listen, 
<laughs> I, I, I am. I am. I'm promoting the conference in five minutes. Give me five minutes. He, he responds with protection and I, t- I knew this was going to be a two-parter. He responds with protection and provision. Exodus 13, verses 21 and 22 talks about how when he was leading the children of Israel out again, that same wave of rescue, he talked about uh, talks about how he was a, a, a pillar of smoke and a cloud of fire. Listen, sometimes you feel listen, sometimes you feel like you're being poked, but be it unto me as you say. Listen, Kendra, I'm trying to tell you this thing is good. Listen, with protection and provision. He listen, he led them during the day. Like he was a cloud of smoke, like he made sure that they knew where they were going. Like he sheltered them, like he put that cloud of smoke over them to make sure that they didn't burn up in the hot sun. But then at night he became a pillar of fire so that he could lead them and show them where to go. And the thing was that he separated like the cloud and the pillar, the cloud of smoke and the pillar of fire separated the Israelites from the Egyptians so that they couldn't see each other. So it's funny that make this little visual. The Israelites and the Egyptians are here. Right. They're literally probably like this close to one another. But because God is God, he puts this cloud of uh, smoke and this pillar of fire in between them. So even though I can hear the enemy behind me, they can't access me because God is protecting me. The enemy is literally on my heels. But because God is protecting me, they can't get to me. We the Israelites called out to him and said, God, look, we're suffering. They're treating us bad. We are your chosen people. You've got to do something. And at the appointed time, God responded because he he heard the sincerity of their hearts. All right. Listen, he responded with protection and provision. Even while they were in that moment, listen, they couldn't get all the things that they needed. Their feet didn't grow. And if they did, the shoes extended with their feet so they did. They weren't out of clothes. They weren't out of shoes. He made sure that they, listen, he sent, like, he, let me tell you something. God was a banging chef. Like, he sent honey crackers and all this type of, like, he, the dew became their food. He sent manna from heaven because they were in such a desperate state to get out. While he was delivering them, he still provided for them what they needed. Even though they weren't fully delivered yet. They weren't fully where they were going. They hadn't even gotten to the Red Sea yet. They hadn't even gotten to the place where they were like, oh God, but what we going to do now? All we see is this water. I preached this message a couple of years ago, stuck in the middle of a moment. Listen, stuck in the middle of a moment. You, When you're stuck in the, a moment, is just a short period of time. But what happens is we find ourselves in these moments and we're stuck between. I'm stuck between where God is taking me from and where and where he's sending me to. And so what do I do while I'm in the moment? Hey, Gary, what do I do while I'm in that moment? While I'm in that moment, I sit back and I enjoy the provision and the protection of the Lord. Because, again, he put his name on my deliverance. I, the Lord, am going to deliver you. So if he said he's going to do it, it ain't got no choice but to be done. Two more minutes. I preached the message back at the end of June. Um, (laughs) Well, the message kind of shifted. But we talked about, listen, help my response to your word be different. We talked about the great meeting. The Bible talks about that uh, when God does things, he does them after the counsel of his own will. So when he does, and that's W-I-L-L, when he does it, when he calls, he has this board meeting, if you will. So it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And they sit down and they talk about, just like they do in any other board meeting, they sit down and they talk about what they're going to do in your life. I'm going to let Kendra be the one that I use as an agent of healing. But before I can get her there, we've got to put her, you know, send her through this moment of sickness where she's like, God, look, I don't understand what's going on. You told me you would use me and you would give me the gift of healing. But all I see is sickness. So because they say at the end of the meeting, all opposed say nay. All in favor, say I, I, they said, okay, that's how it's going to be. My word and my name are on it. So even though all she sees is sickness at the end of this thing, she's going to see healing, not just for herself, but for the people that we've assigned to her. Huh? It's 8.05. Listen, I'm going to honor y'all's time. I said I wasn't going to listen. So we stopped that protection and provision. Listen, tomorrow... I got some other things. <laughs> Kendra, you can say nay all you want, but at the end of the day, your nay has got to become a yay unless you forfeit the promise. Huh? So you've got two options. 
either you can say, be it unto me as you say, or God, I'm going to accept your promise the way that you gave it to me, because I understand that the process to get to the promise is going to be even better than the process. Listen, let me tell you something. The way I just felt this Holy Ghost rise up on me. <laughs> Woo, God, I love you. Listen, tomorrow again, seven o'clock to eight o'clock. Listen, I mean, not necessarily, you know, she's, she's got a lot of ailments and things that she's dealing with. But I honestly believe and I know for a fact that when I first met Kendra, I told her, I said, I see your feet traveling around the globe and God's going to use your life in such a great and powerful way. The only thing that we have to say to the word of the Lord is be it unto me, as you say, because at the end of what you said, I'm going to see what you said. I'm going to have my abracadabra moment. What you see has been created, my shikabaha. What you see has been created, and now I'm walking in it. All right, listen. So we're going to be back tomorrow. I, listen, I'm trying to, hi, yes, Lord. God, I thank you. All right, so tomorrow, listen. And even if they are slave feet, slaves, hey, Montreal, even if they are slave feet, at the end of it, you've got to understand that slaves at, at some point helped other people get free. So if God is saying, or if, if a man or woman of God says, listen, I see you having slave feet. Those are feet that can endure some things. Yes, Lord. Feet that can endure. But at the end of it, beautiful will be the feet of those that carry the gospel and carry the word of deliverance. God, we thank you and we give you praise. Because Listen, all right, I'm done. December 9th and 10th. I know I got to go. I need to drink some more tea. Listen, I don't know what Jordan is. Listen, they can still walk out of the process. The only way the process is not complete is if you willingly say, you know what? I'm out. I'm out of this thing. God, I don't like the way you're doing this. I don't like what you're doing in and with my life. So because I do not like it, I'm going to leave. But I can guarantee you that if you're smart enough, even if you do leave, you will quickly come back because you understand that if you are doing this thing without God, you are in a danger zone. Hear me. If you do this thing, yes, Lord, without God, the dangers that will, listen, the danger that befalls you will be nothing compared to the suffering that you endure when God is on your side. I can suffer knowing that he's with me, but to suffer without God is a dangerous place. Hear me. To suffer and not be under the care of God is a dangerous place. Yes, Lord, we hear you. Where are you? There are zones of regulation. When it comes down to God, there are only two. You're either in the will or out of the will. The perfect will of God. You've got, listen, to suffer in the hands of God is to suffer covered, right? But to suffer out of the will is to suffer in an uncovered place. And when you are uncovered, you don't know when where or how the enemy will snatch you up. God, I thank you. You don't know. And again, like we talked last night, you may not be ready for what, what the kind of fruit that produces from out of that tree. Hear me, suffer covered because you understand that your covering will not leave. To, to suffer uncovered is death. The end result is death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Listen, when you're exposed, when you go to a hospital, after that, you know, even when they're performing, even when you're open, you're covered because the room is sterile. The, the, the physicians have washed and they've properly cleaned themselves so that they don't insert an infection. To suffer outside of the will of God is to willingly lay on the table and be operated on by a filthy surgeon. God, I thank you. Whew. All right, listen. <laughs> We're five minutes over. Next week, December 9th and 10th, Unstopping the Dams and Releasing the Rivers Conference. It's going to be out in Stevensville, Maryland. Please, if you're free, please come. If you want to sponsor somebody, 
please come. Listen, if you are uh, if you're like that unfruitful fig tree, you still have the capabilities of producing. But because you're not, you are cursed. And God says, I can't do anything with you. You've got to die. I can't do anything with you. Um, listen. All right, I'm done. I'm not reading no more comments. I'm done. I'm done. We're going to finish this tomorrow, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Be here, Facebook Live. Again, listen, this was great. I love y'all. I knew this was going to be a two-parter. Um, we're going to pray. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we thank you for being good. We thank you for being God. We thank you for the power of your word that's resident and that's stirring us up even now, oh God. Father, we're praying, oh God, that this word, oh God, will go into the heart of somebody, that they would hear you, that they would get to know you in a different way. God, that our responses to your word would be, be it unto me as you say. God, that you would challenge us to be better, that you would challenge us to change, God. God, that you would heal us from the inside out. Father, we thank you for your word and for how you've met us during this time of fellowship. We're praying, oh God, that even as the video is rewatched and replayed and shared, God, that those that hear it will be blessed. We thank you, oh God, for how you're yet changing, how you're stirring us up, oh God, to love you more and to hear you in a more clear way. Father, we thank you for being the kind of God that responds when we call you. We thank you for being the kind of God that answers our prayers. And we thank you, oh God, for being God and God alone. Now, Father, in this time, we're asking, oh God, that you would seal this word with your anointing, oh God. Let no retaliation, oh God, hit the lives of the people, oh God, because they've allowed themselves to hear, oh God, and to be accountable, oh God, and to even be aware, oh God, of your word in this season. Father, we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we're done. All right, I, listen, let me say, I'm sweating, I'm hot, and I'm excited. Like, I'm gonna have to call somebody after this to kind of get this off of me. Like, this is good. I can't wait till tomorrow. Um, we talked about it. You guys will see the flyer on this page, on the ministry page, JR Ministries. Um, you'll see the flyers there. If you want to sponsor somebody, the conference is only $15. Um, Friday night at 7.30, we're going to have Pastor Lawrence Hub with us. It's going to be amazing. Hey, McKenzie, um, Saturday. Uh, Minister Leonardo Blackman is going to be talking about healing the wounded healer. Pastor Deborah Moyer is going to do a session on encouragement. And then I will be doing uh, the midday uh, breakthrough session. We're going to be talking about the power or, or the intimacy, rather, of resurrection. The intimacy of resurrection. Listen, let me tell you all something. The way that God has been blessing me already through the word, like, I don't even know how that's going to work. But that might have to be a Facebook Live series, too. Um, if y'all want to keep these things going up, please let me know. I don't mind. We'll do it maybe once or twice a week. Let me know. Inbox me, Facebook me. Like, this was great. I love it. Again, we've got some more things to talk about tomorrow. The call and response of the Spirit of God. Again, we're we're about eight minutes over. We said we're going to stop at 8.05. Um, again, this was great. So I love you guys. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Talk to y'all rather tomorrow because I can't see y'all. But y'all can see me. Um, and yeah, we'll do that. So again, if you need more information about the conference, please let me know. If you can, register by this Friday so that we can get a proper head count. Um, I'll give you guys to Monday of next week at the latest so that I can get a head count so that we can make sure that we um, properly register and all this other stuff. Um, the way that you can pay, uh, inbox me, please. I don't have the information right offhand. Inbox me. You can pay via PayPal. You can pay via Eventbrite. If you go to Eventbrite.com, if you type in on stopping the dams and releasing the rivers, it should come up. Um, yeah, just inbox me, put it on my Facebook. I'll type it out. Um, if you want to come, I'll invite you to the event group so that you can see all the information there. Listen, this conference is, excuse me, I'm sorry, going to be life changing. Listen, let me tell you something. These last six months have been one of the hardest seasons that I've ever had to endure. And at one point, I felt like a dam that was stopped up. I did not understand what God was doing in my life. But he told me, I have to take you through this season so that you can understand the weight and the power of what I placed on your life. And once you understand that, no longer will you take it lightly that I've called you to be my vessel and that I've called you to reproduce my word and my name in the earth. Amen. So if you're willing, if you're able, if you can come, please do that. We're going to Facebook Live. We're going to stream. We're going to do some things uh, regarding that. So again, December 9th and 10th. It's a Friday and a Saturday. That Saturday is going to be amazing. After the midday breakthrough, we're going to break for a minute. We'll come back. 
um, at five o'clock that afternoon. We're going to have worship in the word. It'll just be good. Thank you, Ontario. On stopping the dams and releasing the rivers. Um, we're going to just do worship in the word. So it's going to be myself and a, a team of prophets, um, prophetic minstrels, prophetic Levites. We're going to be singing the word of the Lord, declaring verbally the word of the Lord over the lives of the people. Don't let transportation be an issue. Listen, if you need to, if you need a way to get there, if you need to ride with somebody, let me know. I guarantee you, we'll make sure that you'll get there. We'll make sure that you that we get all the kinks worked out so that everybody who wants to come can be a part of this move of God. Kendra says she's not coming. Kendra, you don't have to come. Why? Because what God said concerning your life is going to happen, whether you come to unstopping the dams and releasing the rivers or not. Amen, somebody. Hey, Sheena. Um, we're just about to get off. Listen, there is listen, the worship is gonna be Liddy McGiddy in these streets. Huh? Listen, let me tell you something. We've got a team of people that I've assembled. Prophetic praises, what I'm going to call them. That's just going to be their new name. So when we sing, they going to sing and we're going to do all of this stuff. Amen. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to have to call Kendra. Prophetic praise is going to be ministered. All right, Rush needs a ride. Rush, we're going to set that up for you. Um, we'll get all of that stuff done. Um, all right, listen. All right, I'm done. I'm done. I love y'all. We're a little bit over, but we'll do this again tomorrow. Uh, maybe we just need to do a call and response series. We'll do some other stuff. Um, I know after the conference, I'm going to have to, again, like go further into the intimacy of resurrection. Cause listen, that thing has stirred me. I've got a list of things that I want to talk about. And so I'll probably start crossing those things off the list. Cause this has been great. Um, Again, if you want to just, you know, so be a blessing. I ain't looking for no money. Like, this is Facebook Live. I don't really care. But if you feel so urged to do that, please let me know. No, we were supposed to be going 8.05, so we're 12 minutes over. All right, love y'all. Got to go. Thank you so much. Tune in tomorrow, 7 to 8 p.m. or 7.05 to 8.05. Log on at 7, though, because I'm starting right at 7.05. We're going to jump in with prayer. Then we're going to do that. Amen? All right, love you guys. See y'all tomorrow. Bye.